This is a Silver Bullet Security Podcast with Gary McGraw. I'm your host, Gary McGraw, CTO of Sigital and author of Software Security. This podcast series is co-sponsored by Sigital and IEEE Security and Privacy Magazine, where a portion of this interview will appear in print. For more, see www.computers.org slash security and www.sigital.com slash silverbullet. This is the 112th in a series of interviews with security gurus, and today I have two gurus with me. I have uh, Matthew Green and Steve Bellavin. Hi, guys. Howdy. How are you doing? So today we're going to interview two of 15 authors of the report Keys Under the Doormats paper, um, an important policy and technology piece published on July 6, 2015. Other authors include Harold Abelson, Ross Anderson, Josh Benela, Mar- Matt Blaze, Whit Diffie, John Gilmore, Susan Landau, Peter Neumann, Ron Rivest, Jeff Schiller, Bruce Schneier, Michael Spector, and Daniel Weitzner. The two co-authors we'll talk to today are Steve Bellavin and Matthew Green. Steve Bellavin, um, who was the guest for Silver Bullet Episode 81, is a professor of computer science at Columbia University. He's also worked as a researcher at AT AT&T Labs and recently served as CTO of the Federal Trade Commission. Matthew Green, who was the guest for Episode 90 of Silver Bullet, is an assistant research professor at the Johns Hopkins Information Security Institute and a well-known practitioner of applied cryptography. So thanks for joining me today, you guys. Glad to be here. Um, Your important paper addresses the idea of including back doors, or what's called exceptional access, for law enforcement and government into crypto systems. Simply put, you find the idea untenable for many technical reasons. The paper appears during what's been called Crypto Wars 2 and harkens back to an earlier 1997 paper that many of the same authors wrote during the first Crypto Wars. So let's start with you, Steve. Who um, converged this group of authors and how did the writing process work and who was added since 1997? Danny Weitzner wrote, uh took the lead to get this effort started. We all felt that something had to be done. Uh, we had a meeting. We uh, discussed what our ideas were, come up with an outline. I actually hosted that meeting here at Columbia. We supplemented that with a few conference calls and, of course, lots of email. And different people were given different sections. Uh, I wrote that. And uh, Danny and Mike Spector uh, were, the ed- were the final editors putting it all together. And we all commented, made little changes, and so on. Mm-hmm. How long did that process take? I think the uh, total process took about t- two months. You know, uh, we would have liked a little more time, but uh, we wanted to be relevant to what's going on in Washington, and that set the, uh, that set the clock. Right, and so us. the the first the paper- effort the effort actually started in late February, but uh, really got moving more uh, early March, and then we got into high gear uh, in June. Right. So, so the first paper, or the one in 1997, had a very similar set of, of co-authors. Who was added this time? Well, Matt Green, Susan Landau, Mike Spector, and I think Danny, uh, who for various organizations, if I recall correctly, for organizational reasons, he had to uh, stay in the background the first time around. I see. I see. And um, where did the idea of a crypto backdoor come from way back in the early days? What happened in 97? Why won't it die? <laughs> well, there were a whole pile of issues that were uh, being fought over in the 90s. Uh, the NSA had long been concerned about uh, access to good crypto by anybody else. You could even date that to the apparent debate within the NSA around 1975 or so about how strong the data encryption standard, DES, was going to be. Some people still believe that the 56-bit key length was a uh, compromise between those who wanted strong crypto and those who wanted to uh, continue to have at least some access to it. The, The particular incident that triggered, that ultimately triggered the 1997 report was the introduction of the Clipper chip, 
uh, a particular design for uh, what became called key escrow, a way for government to have access to the keys of encrypted communication. And that idea in various forms was around for several years. Uh, we wrote that report. There were a whole pile of other things that went into it. Uh, ultimately, '99, the government basically gave up and liberalized uh, the crypto export rules and effectively said, okay, you guys win. Uh, we're not going to do it. It's bad for the economy and bad for the country. Okay, and then obviously something happened and in, in Comey and other law enforcement people, FBI Director Comey, decided to um, look into this notion of backdoors again recently. The, for the last several years, the FBI has been complaining about what they call the going dark problem. Uh, more and more forms of encrypted communication have become common. Uh, there are just more and more forms of communication. Even if it's not encrypted, they don't necessarily know how to deal with it. Everything from Facebook pages, uh, tech, uh, text messages, messages, of course, but other forms of text messages, things like Snapchat, uh, voice communication channels and multiplayer games. There are many different forms of communication, and they have made the case to Congress over the last, call it five years, that they're going dark. Right. Uh, it, is, there, is, hit at, is there evidence that that's true, or do you think that claim is a little overblown? The evidence is at best weak. Uh, the wiretap reports that they release show very few encrypted conversations, uh, and many fewer of those, they can't actually get access to the uh, plain text in some other way. Uh, on the other hand, there are two other factors. One is they claim that certain forms of communication, they don't even bother trying for a warrant because they know they can't do anything with it because it will be strongly encrypted. There's also been the growth of uh, encrypted devices, and this hit ahead, uh, oh, six, eight months ago with the release of iOS 8, where Apple strongly encrypted more of the storage of the iPhone by default. It came out in the hearing the day after our report was released that uh, the National Security uh, organizations like the NSA care about communications crypt, uh, cryptography. Local police departments care about device cryptography. The FBI cares about both. So uh, the issue of device cryptography was not really an issue in the 90s it is now. Right. So Matthew, as a person who came to this in between iterations um, and was pretty young, I guess, during the crypto wars um, first iteration, how did you get involved, and what do you think has changed? Um, why is this an issue that's important to you? Yeah, I, I was. I, I was pretty young during the first iteration. In fact, I came to it just as it was winding up. Uh, I started working for AT&T, uh, also as a staff member, about 1999. Um, and this was just during the period when the crypto wars were being won, and I thought that was the end of it. There would never be another crypto wars in my lifetime. So it was very surprising to me in about uh, maybe 2011, 2012, when this notion of uh, Calia 2 began to be mooted, where people were discussing wiretapping on, on electronic devices and, and dealing with encrypted data. Uh, and that all died away in 2013 with the Snowden revelations. And then it came back, and it's come back with kind of a vengeance. Uh, my perspective on it is really the big difference between what's happening now and what happened, happened in the 1990s is that for the first time ever, people are actually using crypto. I mean, not using it at, you know, the 1% or 2% mark, but actually using it at, you know, 30%, 40% of people are using it. Now that it's default in all iPhones for both device encryption and for text messaging, I mean, this is, this is you know, a substantial difference. It's a, it's a qualitative difference in terms of what crypto means to law enforcement. Right, so, so, so that's, why, that, that's what you think is really driving the law enforcement angle. Yep, it's, it's, they're, not, they're not afraid of crypto as long as it's a few, you know, goofballs using PGP. They're scared of it when it's everybody with an iPhone. right. Right. Um, let me ask you this question, too. So first, pretend this is not me asking. Uh, if crypto is so mathematically sound, why do you say in the paper that unanticipated security flaws will pop up, and why can't these just be fixed? We're not very good at doing this stuff even without backdoors. I mean, if you look at the history of, let's say, uh, TLS over the last year or two, we've had 
at least two major vulnerabilities where, where TLS, that's the protocol used to secure every web connection, has just broken down completely to the point where you can actually intercept any connection. And of course, we had Heartbleed last year. So, so we're talking about a pretty bad situation before you get to backdoors. Adding backdoors is what's really scary to us. Right. So, so the thought is that security engineering is in such a poor state that it's very unlikely we'd get something right. That, that's one of the biggest concerns for me. Steve, do you have anything to add on that issue? Yeah, there are a couple of issues. One, this has certainly been part of the issue with TLS, is implementation flaws are very uh, common, and the more complicated the uh, protocol, the harder it is to do the implementation. Our mathematical tools are not where we would like them to be. Now, I want to go harken back to the Needham-Schroeder protocol, which is the oldest cryptographic protocol in the open literature. is published in 1979. And... At the very end of the paper, they said, hey, you know, this stuff looks hard. We think that people are going to make a lot of mistakes doing it. And that was one of the more prescient comments I've ever seen in a technical paper. Right. And it's interesting to recount the history of that protocol. So they published it in 79, and four years later, Denning and Sacco found a problem, and they proposed a fix. Uh... And three years after that, Needham and Schroeder looked at the fix and said, oops, you got it wrong. Here's how to fix your fix. <laughs> and then in 1995, Lowe said, uh, showed that, oh, there's another flaw even more serious in the original Needham-Schroeder protocol, in one variant of it. And by the way, in modern notation, that protocol would be three messages long, and the flaw is so obvious, I could explain it in five minutes to an undergraduate who's got minimal crypto background. And it went unnoticed from 1979 to 1995. And this is the oldest protocol in the open literature. So not only are we bad at building systems that don't involve complicated mathematics, but math complicated mathematics and protocols makes it even more difficult. And I would add that the needham shorter protocol was formally verified. And it, the verification was simply wrong. It didn't wasn't a strong enough verification me, uh, method. Right. Yeah, we're 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 constantly trying to develop what it means to formally verify something, and even the definitions are still changing. And it's 2015, so it's a moving target. So I wanted to ask you something, Matthew. Um, you guys talk about forward secrecy, um, and I think that's an important concept when it comes to communications cryptography. So what is forward secrecy, and why does that matter to this? situation. So with a lot of older encryption protocols, the idea is that I have one public key and then anybody can encrypt to that. And that's great until I lose my laptop and my, my private key gets stolen or I accidentally back my laptop up to the cloud and then my private key is up there. And then every email I've ever sent that's encrypted is now basically readable by the person who gets that private key. Um, the idea of forward secrecy is that we fix that problem by basically deriving new keys for every message sent or at least very regularly. And so even if my key gets stolen at a certain time, my older emails are not going to be readable. We're going to throw away those old keys. And that's built into a lot of modern communication systems like the signal protocol, which is used in WhatsApp. Uh, and unfortunately, that's just, it's very hard to combine that with these exceptional as uh, access key escrow ideas because they break that whole idea by putting in a master backdoor. So, Steve, maybe you can explain that. Why does exceptional access make systems more complex, and why does complexity even really matter? Okay, so the way I look at it, security is a systems problem. It's not a property of any one component. It's a property of everything put together. The old line about a chain being as strong as the weakest link very much applies. So... Maybe I'll cryptanalyze the algorithm. We have new results on coming out uh, uh, just out on RC4. Or maybe I'll break the protocol. Or maybe I'll break the code. Or maybe I'll break the way you're actually using it. When I write an academic paper, I don't want something that's trivial. I want something that's academically elegant. When I'm out in the real world, I don't really care. If I have to bribe somebody with a candy bar for their password, I'll do that. If I can cryptanalyze it, I'll do that. There are just so many new pieces. Uh, you know, the standard cryptographic protocol, the kind we've been working on for 35 years, is a two-party protocol. And even that, as we've noted, is very hard to get right. TLS is a 
classic example of one that's been very, very troublesome in recent years. But with exceptional access, I suddenly have to add a third party, and I have to restrict who that third party is and only let them have it under certain circumstances, and only if they're the right third party. And that's got to be in the protocol, and it's got to be in the code. And you can make really, really subtle mistakes or really, really stupid mistakes. So there was a design, oh, uh, late 90s, to add a so-called ADK, additional decryption key, field to a certificate so that when I sent an email, it would encrypted email, encrypted to the recipient, and encrypted to somebody else. Well, it turns out that they forgot to put the ADK the, uh, field in the protected, signed part of the certificate, which meant that anybody could substitute in their own key, and therefore if you're going to encrypt it to your enemy as well as to your recipient. Again, trivial sort of thing to fix once you know but you've got to notice this in the first place. And these things can go unnoticed for years. Hmm. And I guess uh, exceptional access also has a tendency to concentrate targets um, because it's one key for many other possible communications channels, at least in the designs that have been talked about so far. Is that right, Matt? Yeah, we have this, this problem of who's going to hold that key. Uh, in the in the nineties there were proposals to split keys and put them, you know, in two different government organizations. You would need a warrant to get those two components. But then the question is how do you recombine those shares and does that place where you recombine them become a, a weak point? Uh, there's also a question of well should should the vendor, should Apple or Google hold one share of that key? And then how do they secure it? So there there are many problems here that just haven't been thought through very well. Yeah, it, don't neglect the process. Back in the days of Clipper, I was talking to someone who was a former prosecutor, and she was terrified of the Clipper chip. You'd think she'd be the absolute perfect proponent for it. No, she was a narcotics prosecutor, and she was convinced that uh, some of the big drug gangs had the money, the resources, and the ruthlessness to get access to uh, the key escrow database. They're going to extort their way in, they're going to bribe their way in, they were going to blackmail their way in, but they could do it. They were powerful enough, they had the resources. She was terrified that they were going to use this to spy on law enforcement communications. How do you secure that? And it's not just the technical matters, it's the process. How does a key escrow agency verify the request from a law enforcement agency that they've never heard of in some town they don't know where it is, which may be in another country, and does the request comply with U.S. law? Uh, all of this is part of the system, not just the over-the-wire components or the endpoints. It's the escrow agency and everything that goes with it as well. We'll be right back after this message. This is Gary McGraw, your host for the Silver Bullet Security Podcast. If you like what you're hearing here, you should check out my monthly security column published by Search Security and Information Security Magazine. You can find the most recent column at searchsecurity.com slash McGraw. All of my writings are collected on my webpage at www.sigital.com slash gem slash writings. Thanks for listening. So, Matthew, on Sunday, the seemingly thoroughly confused editors of the Washington Post agreed with FBI Director Comey that back doors were necessary. Um, how can they be so confused? And isn't this partially our fault at, at, in the technical community? Well, I think that the Silicon Valley has a problem where they don't devote enough resources to, I guess, educating uh, policymakers. They spend money in Washington, D.C., but I'm not sure it, it does everything that they think it's doing. So I think part of the re par problem here is that people making these decisions don't really understand the consequences, uh, and they're getting one distorted view. I think uh, another problem here is that, you know, there's, there's a tendency to think, well, it can be done. People tell us, you know, they've worked out a solution on a whiteboard that makes it easy, but they don't understand the actual engineering challenges. And like everything Steve is saying, where you have these incredibly complex systems that will exist, that have never existed before, that have to be built, and only after we build them will we find out how vulnerable they are. So it's easy to look at a theoretical model of this and say it, it seems easy. So why do you think the technology press is not able to understand the tech? 
So the technology press has actually been doing a fairly good job, I think, of, of expressing this. The problem is they're running into a brick wall. They're you know, writing articles. There have been reports uh, like ours that try to explain it well, but at the end of the day, you have, uh, for example, Director Comey saying, well, I've been told by experts that it's very difficult or impossible, but you know, essentially I believe it's possible. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to educate with technology when you have people who are really motivated to make this happen. Right. So, Steve, you spent some time in Washington um, at the FTC, and you've run into these policymakers yourself um, directly. What do you have to add about that notion of people who may not understand the subtleties of the technology or have a certain position that where the technology doesn't matter to them? When you're not in a field, it's very easy to overlook or not understand or not realize the complexity of the field, the expertise that it actually takes. It's not just technology. Let's talk about that other favorite thing in Washington, climate change. And this is, of course, has been debated for many, many years. Uh, but I'll actually hearken back to something I believe was said in the 90s by a uh, former New Hampshire Governor John Sununu. And he said, oh, well, I don't really believe in this. And he whipped up a model on his own PC as a very simplified model, and he ran his model and said, no, it's not a problem. Why does he think that a model that he can put on his PC when he's not an expert in the field in any way represents the complexity of atmospheric dynamics and so on and so on? Or let's take something else we all know about, antitrust. We all know what antitrust is. Big, bad monopolies abusing their power. Well, when I was at the FTC, I got to see up close and personal just how sophisticated and deep some of the analyses were in deciding whether or not there was an antitrust problem. Uh, yeah, they're real mathematical analyses. Could I do those? No, absolutely not. I don't have the economics background. But the Bureau of Economics at the FTC sure does. It's not just a legal matter. It's a very complicated, sophisticated economics matter. Uh, that you just don't see. Okay, so why is it why, why is, is it, a jet engine so? Go on. Wh- go on. Why is it then that that the the policymakers don't make use of of things like the economists at the FTC talking about antitrust situations, or scientists at NOAA or at NASA talking about global warming, or you know scientists who do very good jobs for the government when it comes to security to talk about this kind of key escrow stuff. There's a big component of wishful thinking. If you don't want it to be true, it can't be, Uh, especially when you don't really understand deeply uh, why it should be. You know, my personal uh, yardstick for deciding whether or not uh, somebody is competent is how they respond to unpleasant facts. (laughs) You, You don't... Your ideology, uh, late Senator Moynihan put it this way, you're entitled to your own opinions, you're not entitled to your own facts. Start with the facts and then say, what is a response to these facts that's compatible with my ideology or philosophy, not these facts don't exist. Uh, And maybe you need different resources, maybe you need a different approach. Again, climate change is the right approach. Regulation, cap and trade, let things happen anyway. You know, all of those are ideological positions, but don't tell me it's not happening. The same is true for this crypto system. If you don't like the consequences of cryptography, well, that's how do you respond. If you don't like the fact that we can't build these golden key backdoor exceptional access mechanisms securely, well, Okay, fine. What do you do about it? Uh, you know, uh, Matt Blaze and Susan Lando and I, who are all, all three of us are authors of this paper, and one of Matt's students, Andy Clark, did a uh, couple of papers, uh, one of which did appear in IEEE Security and Privacy, on lawful hacking. We call it going bright in one of the papers. Hack in, you know, with a proper warrant, hack into computers to go around the crypto. These are there are certainly issues there, but to us it was better than weakening the security mechanisms and adding new vulnerabilities. Uh, that was our response. There are possibly other responses, but 
make your, sure that your response is compatible with the facts as best you know them. Right. So I want to. I want to just add one thing to that, which is that I do think that the people making these these uh, pleas have a source of information, technical information. Uh, for better or for worse, that source of technical information is the National Security Agency, and the people at the NSA are telling them that key escrow can be done. Uh, it's possible they can build systems that do it. I mean, they're being essentially asked by their you know political. You, Masters, Commander in Chief, they're being asked. You know, we need this. Can you do it? Yeah. See, and but th- those guys are working at cross purposes, though, because they're charged with um, eavesdropping on all the communications and breaking systems. And so, it it it's sort of <laughs> if obvious why they would say you can do it if you can't. Well, me. even if you give them, I mean, even if you give them full credit for you know doing the right thing and trying to secure U.S. systems, I think that you end up with a group of people who you know, maybe are, are not experienced with actually building and deploying systems. If you have people in Silicon Valley making these decisions, they know what's actually involved. I see. If you have people at the National Security Agency saying, yes, it can be done, we worked it out on a whiteboard, so don't let these scientists tell us that it can't be done, I think that's where you wind up with a disconnect. Oh, that's interesting. And there are plenty of people at the NSA who understand the real-world implementation difficulties of this because that's their job, too. They know how they break systems, and... Uh, they do it by exploiting mistakes. You know, let's harken back to history. Uh, with the Enigma machine, I've seen a you know, post-war declassified memo by the uh, British saying, hey, if the Germans had used the Enigma correctly, we couldn't have broken it. Right. They didn't use it correctly, right. which was good for the world, but uh, there were just mistakes made in uh, the use of what should have been a sound design. So let me ask you uh, both this question. Why would criminals and terrorists and other boogeymen bad guys not use real crypto without backdoors that's already been published and is widely available now? I think a lot of them will. Uh, The most serious enemies, the ones they're really concerned about, will roll their own, will go around uh, these requirements. And so you're not going to get the benefit against the enemies you really care about. On the other hand, a lot of people will... Take the easy way out. What is off the shelf? What's in the iPhone? What's in Windows? Uh, what's in the Android phone? I will turn it on. You know, Justice Scalia is fond of saying, we've never held there's any law against taking advantage of stupid criminals. Uh, right. And that that's certainly a large part of it, too. They will catch the low-hanging fruit, the stupid guys, but it won't help them against the uh, ones they really care about. Matthew, anything if they want to look at it a little bit more sophisticated, they'll say, well, it's really hard to do crypto. If they try to roll their own, they'll make their own mistakes too, and we can exploit those. Right. But I don't know if they think that well, far I, ahead. I also think that if you can keep the use of crypto down to 2% of email or any given medium, it's a whole lot easier to do analysis then and figure out who are the bad guys. Uh, just by looking at metadata. Whereas if 50% of everybody, 50% of people are using encryption, life gets more difficult. Right. So it's just a, a large number law thing. <laughs> so so what, if any, impact did the OPM attack have on your thinking about this issue, Matt? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I'm trying to be fair about this. I mean, I think what we learned from OPM is that the federal government's IT infrastructure is not in great shape. I, it's really not. To be a little bit fair about this, holding a master key would be obviously, hopefully, would be would be better secured using hardware than something like a big old database running with you know COBOL code, uh, you know, trying to drive it. However, on the flip side, it's a whole lot more difficult to steal a multi-gigabyte database than it is to store a handful of relatively small keys and numbers. So I am not confident about the federal government, at least the you know the non-NSA portions of the federal government's ability to keep a secret like this. What do you think, Steve? Uh, the OPM hack shows just how hard it is for, to secure a large system. I think there, I think you could do a whole separate podcast on uh, IT security in the federal government and its <laughs> many uh, weaknesses and failings, yeah. but that's a separate issue. Uh, it's, I'm not w- worried about the technical basis of storing one key that you never use. When you have to use it, you get into trouble. Right. Uh, you know, we've seen no leaks of, no publicized leaks of the master key for uh, the NSA's 
uh, designed and operated secure telephone network, the STU-3, the, STU the STEs, and so on. They know how to secure a key, but the whole process for gaining access to it and using it, that's also part of the system, and that's where I worry. Uh, one key, go lock up in an HSM someplace. Using it, that's when you get in trouble. Right. So let's let's wrap this up with with kind of an open-ended question. Steve, you first. What can we do to better educate the government, especially lawmakers in the executive branch, about security, security engineering, sound technology, crypto in the real world, and so forth? We just have to keep trying and explaining that this, this really is hard, and just because Silicon Valley can produce marvelous things doesn't mean that they can do anything. Every time you see a blue screen of death, every time you've got to go reboot your machine, every time you have to install a security patch, whether it's Microsoft's Patch Tuesday or anything else, that represents flaws that an enemy could exploit. And the fact that we are constantly seeing these updates is a sign of just how bad our software is. I wrote more than 20 years ago that the real security problem was buggy software. It still is. Yep, I, I, I believe you on that one. <laughs> so, Matthew. I thought you would. <laughs> Matthew, how about you? Well, I, one of the things that's really struck me about this debate is how many different requirements there are and, and how it's backed everybody into a corner. It seems like... There's a requirement that Washington, D.C. not dictate cryptographic design to Silicon Valley. That seems reasonable. But simultaneously, there's a set of requirements that maybe plain text be accessible in certain circumstances very quickly uh, to fight crimes. Um, and at the same time, there has to be, you know, Washington has, the President Obama said we need strong encryption, uh, and the FBI is asking for this exceptional access. When you try to fit these all together, you end up in a situation where it's really hard. You either end up with, with Silicon Valley developing their own solutions with nobody supervising them, in which case some companies will just really do it badly. And then on the flip side, you end up with a situation where Washington, D.C. is writing a design document and sending it to Google and Apple to implement, uh, which is really not pleasant either. So yeah. I don't know how they're going to actually resolve that. Yeah. Well, thanks, you two, for talking about this for a while. Um, I'd like to encourage everybody to download the paper um, keys under the doormats, um, which is available all over the net, and read it. Um, it's a it's a quick read and it's thorough and it's really important. And most importantly, let your uh, political representatives know that you care about this stuff and that we have to get it right. So thanks, you two. Quite welcome. My pleasure. This has been a Silver Bullet Security Podcast with Gary McGraw. Silver Bullet is co-sponsored by Sigital and IEEE Security and Privacy Magazine, and syndicated by Search Security. The May-June 2015 issue of IEEE S&P focuses on diversity, crypto, and identity management. The issue also features our Silver Bullet interview with Bart Perneal of KU Leuven. Show links, notes, and an online discussion can be found on the Silver Bullet webpage at www.sigital.com silverbullet. This is Gary McGraw.